everyone. Good morning to our, all our esteemed guests. Welcome to the Beeps Dhaka Tribune Roundtable titled Changing Nature of Conflict, Fighting Hybrid War in the 21st Century. The moderators for today are Major General A.N.M. Munir Zaman, President of Beeps, and Mr. Zafar Sobhan, Editor of Dhaka Tribune. Our speaker for this roundtable are Dr. Lieutenant General A.T.M. Zahir Alo, Group Captain Dr. Mohammad Zahidul Islam Khan, and Mr. Shafkat Munir. Without further delay, I would like to request the moderators to carry on the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you. And a very good morning and assalamu alaikum to all our esteemed participants and guests. We are about to begin the monthly roundtable on strategic issues that we do together with Dhaka Tribune. And our today's subject is changing nature of conflict, fighting hybrid war in the 21st century. Hybrid war can represent warfare in the 21st century, a new type of direct or indirect confrontation with effects on short-term, medium-term, and long-term consequences, and sometimes impossible to anticipate and comprehend. If you allow me to go a little bit to history, as I see as a student of military science, hybrid war did exist for centuries. What has changed is the articulation and the sophisticated nature of application of hybrid techniques. And I see that the current articulation of hybrid warfare as we know it today was first articulated by General Mattis of the U.S. Army while talking to the Defense Forum in 2005. Later, together with Frank Hoffman, General Mattis wrote an article in 2005 articulating the concept of hybrid warfare. But it is Hoffman who elaborated the concept in a monograph in 2007 where he says that hybrid war incorporates a range of different modes of warfare, including conventional capabilities, irregular tactics and formations, terrorist tactics, coercion, and a range of criminal disorder. So it's a wide range of techniques that one can apply while talking about hybrid warfare. And it's a combination of activities such as disinformation, economic manipulation, use of proxies and insurgents, diplomatic pressure, military action, legal action, and the menu is long. So therefore, hybrid warfare is also a complex warfare. Sometimes it is referred to as irregular or non-state actors with advanced military capabilities and the best example that one can cite is the 2006 Israel-Lebanon war where Hezbollah as a non-state or a semi-state acted with all capabilities and tools of hybrid warfare. What has changed now is that cyber and IT techniques and capabilities has given us enhanced capa capacities to do things that was not possible in the pre-IT world. In many ways, hybrid war operates below the threshold of warfare. So it's a pre-threshold warfare where kinetic war warfare does not begin. So you suppress the enemy without probably applying kinetic operations or hard military options. And it is best articulated by the concept given out by Sun Tzu that the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And that is exactly what hybrid warfare does. In other words, it continues where politics ends or politics slows down and in the words of Clausewitz, war is nothing more than the continuation of politics by other means. 
So it's a fine combination of art and science, of politics and military power, non-military power, irregular power, and a fine blend of all the techniques that are available in our hands. Some have also called it the 5G warfare, where all kinds of non-kinetic military actions, social engineering, disinformation and misinformations, cyber attacks, and these days enhanced with AI and autonomous systems. So we are truly entering a world where fighting is becoming too sophisticated and complex. It is no longer the business of the military alone, but a wide range of actors play a bigger role in fighting a hybrid warfare. And this is exactly the way warfare probably would be fought in the future, with more sophistication, more techniques, and more actors acting in a space where everybody's involved. So we've got an excellent panel of our speakers today who have tremendous experience on the subject. So I will, without delay, hand over to the first speaker, Lieutenant Angel ATM Zahirul Alam, who will introduce us to the concept of hybrid warfare. So you have the floor. Thank you, General Munir. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. In fact, the moderator said it all, really. Uh, <coughs> and this is a topic uh, uh, which has been in currency for long, for, for quite some time now. And as you see that uh, many of the things that the moderator said, I think will be repeated by some of us here we will be deliberating on the subject. Uh, I hope that you will pardon those repetitions because it is it will be difficult for me to really change my script at this point of time. I would like to begin with two quotes from Karl von Clausewitz, the famous Prussian general and one of the most eminent military thinkers and strategists of all times. What has already been said by him, what is nothing but the continuation of politics by other means. The other one is, every age has its own kind of war, its own limiting conditions, and its own peculiar preconceptions. Simplistically speaking, hybrid warfare is a form of warfare which entails an interplay or fusion of conventional and unconventional instruments of power, means, and methods used in various degrees along with tools of subversion to achieve its ends and objectives. These instruments and tools are blended in a synchronized manner to exploit the vulnerabilities of an antagonist and achieve synergistic effects. Is it a new form of warfare? As already said by the moderate, it isn't. A survey of military history would show that such warfare is as old as warfare itself. Nevertheless, it has gained significant currency and relevance in recent years as states are seen to employ non-state actors, often armed with sophistication weapon and technology, information technology, etc to subdue their adversaries during or, more importantly, in the absence of a direct armed conflict. Two important developments or events in the contemporary era brought hybrid warfare to the fore in policy debates. The first one is, as already told by him, Frank Hoffman, F former U.S. Marine and a defense scholar in his writing in 2007 proposed, maybe possibly has coined this word also for the first time, hybrid warfare as a theory of military strategy which employs political warfare and blends conventional warfare, irregular warfare, and cyber warfare with other influencing methods such as fake news, diplomacy, lawfare, and foreign electoral intervention. Around that time, the former U.S. 
Army Chief General W. Casey Jr. talked of a new type of war, a hybrid of irregular warfare and conventional warfare, which according to him would become increasingly common in the future. The second development was an accession of Crimea by Russia, wherein as accused by the West, Russia achieves its objectives by virtue of conflating deniable special forces, local armed actors, economic clout, disinformation, and exploitation of socio-political polarization in Crimea. <coughs> According to NATO, hybrid threats combine military and non-military as well as covert and overt means, including disinformation, cyber attacks, economic pressure, deployment of irregular arms groups as proxies, and use of regular forces. Hybrid methods are used to blur the line between war and peace and attempt to sow doubt in the minds of target population. By combining kinetic operations with subversive efforts, the aggressor intends to avoid attribution or retribution. An article published in Global Security Review title, What is Hybrid Warfare, compares the notion to the Russian concept of nonlinear warfare, which it defines as the deployment of conventional and irregular military forces in conjunction with psychological, economic, political, energy, and cyber assaults. The hybrid operation in this format is backed by the implicit threat of tactical or even strategic nuclear deployment in order to cow down governments and influence global public opinion. The U.S. Army defines hybrid warfare or threat as the diverse and dynamic combination of regular forces, irregular forces, criminal elements, or a combination of these forces and elements all unified to achieve mutually benefiting effects. The European Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats contends that hybrid threats are methods and activities that are targeted towards vulnerabilities of the opponent where the range of methods and activities are wide and vast. The political warfare, as referred to by Frank Hoffman, commonly refers to war being em employed to achieve national objectives in a way that falls short of physical conflict or total warfare. Such warfare is conducted in the gray zone of conflict, meaning operations may not clearly cross the threshold of war, as has been already said by our moderator. This is done by exploiting the ambiguity of international law, ambiguity of actions and attributions, or because the impact of the activities does not justify a full response by international community or international institutions. Because hybrid warfare, as deliberated often, takes place below the traditional threshold of war, what takes the center stage is the role of the civilians, how they think and act. Hence, the antagonist states need a convincing narrative to ensure support of its home population. At the same time, she needs, a, needs to craft and execute a propaganda campaign to create wedge or distrust in the adversary state between people and people and between people and the state and also in support of other states and their people and the global community. Hence, hybrid warfare has four battlefields. Namely, conventional battlefield, the indigenous population of the conflict zone, the home population, and the international community. How do a state or states counter hybrid threats? To counter hybrid threats, hard power is often ins insufficient. Often the conflict evolves under the rudder and even a rapid response turns out to be too late. Overwhelming force is insufficient deterrent. Even many advanced militaries lack the flexibility to shift tactics, priorities, and objectives consistently or constantly 
as the scenario, to commensurate the scenario and developments that require multiple responses. Vast canvas, multiple lines of operations, military, intelligence, diplomatic, political, economic, counter-propaganda and cyber war, information, counter-irregular force and dissident population, counter-terrorism, counter-criminals and transnational crimes, etc., complicate and make the response very, very complex. Great harmony as synergy is required amongst and between plethora of state institutions and agencies, which is not easy to achieve. Hence, in most cases, hybrid conflicts become protracted and not easily, easily resolvable. The classic example of hybrid warfare are the ongoing Syrian conflict and the war between Russia and Ukraine that is now the talk of the town. I will end here reading out what Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov had said about hybrid warfare speaking at the Valdai Discussion Club in November 2014. Quote, it is an interesting term but I would apply it above all to the United States and its war strategy. It's truly a hybrid war aimed not so much as defeating the enemy militarily as at changing the regimes in the state that pursue a policy Washington does not like. It is using financial and economic pressure, information attacks, using others on the perimeter of a corresponding state as proxies and of course, information and ideological pressure through external finance, non-governmental organizations. It is not a hybrid process and not what we call war, unquote. So, ladies and gentlemen, to reiterate the famous quote, so hybrid warfare is one of the current ongoing politics by other means. Thank you. I end here. Thank you, Zahir. That was a elaborate introduction on the concept of hybrid warfare. Two key takeaways from here. It is also a multi-domain warfare. You act on multiple domains at one time. And a key takeaway that I see uh, after listening to his presentation, it hits at the hearts and minds of the population. Particularly, it tries to break down the trust that governments have with the people. The social contract between the citizens and the government is the very essence of governance and stability of a state. And that's where it hits and it breaks down the trust between the governance structures of the state and the trust between the government or the state and the citizens. We'll have further elaboration of many of these concepts by our next speakers. And I now hand over the floor to Shafkat. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see everyone. This is our last event of uh, 2022, so it's wonderful to see a full house here to talk about a very important subject. I would preface my remarks by saying that when we talk about hybrid war, uh, it should not be seen as an abstract concept only applicable in Europe or and in other continents. Hybrid war is a reality of our present generation of warfare, and it is as applicable to our region as anywhere else. So as a country, as a military, we should also be studying this concept very carefully because it has applicability for us. Uh, the moderator and our previous speaker, uh, General Zahir, has already pointed out about the, con the conceptual ideas about hybrid war. I want to delve a bit into some of the tools and techniques. The key question before us is that can there be war without any direct or combat or physical confrontation taking place? Over the years, I think what we have seen is the risk or the uh, hazard or the cost of all-out warfare is so high that many countries find it more conducive to fight war just below the threshold. And that's where the concept of hybrid war becomes so important. It also remains very closely linked to the philosophy of war as well. And we will have to constantly go back to our two favorite military 
theorist or strategist uh, Herr von Kloschwitz and uh, Sun Tzu because we cannot talk about war without constantly referring to them. If we go back to Sun Tzu's concept about supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting, hybrid attacks essentially try to achieve that because they're marked by a lot of vagueness. The country that is targeted is either not able to detect a hybrid attack or not able to attribute it to a state that might be might be perpetrating or sponsoring it. And that's the whole mantra of what hybrid warfare is. We can break hybrid warfare into several uh, subparts, and they are political, economic, military, civil, or in the information domain. We often hear a lot about the use of disinformation and influence operations as a tool of hybrid war, but there are other tools as well which I want to lay before you. Perhaps the most important tool that we uh, see attributed to hybrid warfare is political warfare, and it refers to the employment of military, intelligence, diplomatic, financial, and other means, just short of conventional war, to achieve national objectives. In this case, it can include overt operations like public broadcasting and covert operations like psychological warfare and support to underground resistance groups. Some of the key characteristics of political warfare that scholars have now presented before us are employment of all elements of national power, relying heavily on unattributable forces and means, staying below the re legal threshold of an open armed conflict, extending traditional conflict and achieving effects at lower costs, exploiting shared ethnic or religious bonds or other internal uh, schisms within society, and therefore, for the state which is the target of such political warfare, it requires a heavy investment into various types of resources, including intelligence resources, in order to be able to detect that political warfare is being perpetrated against them. One uh, example that often comes uh, up quite a lot in terms of political warfare is interference in electoral processes. And that has been happening quite a lot across the world in many places, where the adversary can use techniques from campaigning through the media and social networks to securing financial resources for a particular political group to influence the outcome of an election in a direction that favors the adversary's political interests. So I think these are uh, things that we need to study and analyze very carefully because uh, uh, it has, as I said at the beginning, it has applicability even for countries like ours or in a re region like ours. So it is not an abstract concept which we will only hear about from Europe. A hybrid war can be uh, applicable for us as well. Some scholars also argue that the use of unmanned drones uh, can be a tool of hybrid war as well, as long as there is deniability. The next domain that we look at is the economic domain, where hybrid war is pursued through uh, uh, media campaigns, social media campaigns, sanctions, and uh, we see that uh, financial influence is brought about to where an adversary can make investments, conclude unfavorable uh, deals in terms of uh, to undermine the other country's energy security and so on, or offer loans that make a country vulnerable in the long term to political pressure. So in a way, the employment of economic tools is very much a part of hybrid warfare as well. And uh, this is still an ongoing debate in scholarship on hybrid warfare, whether economic coercion can be a tool, but many scholars have already identified that yes, economic coercion or what we call uh, in certain, uh, what has been termed in certain places as predatory economics can also be a tool of hybrid warfare. If population is the center of gravity in any war, then we see that civilian populations are central to any designing of hybrid warfare tools. Because civilian populations are central to the conflict as sources for socio-political vulnerabilities in a society and as targets for non-military threats and attacks using mis- or disinformation campaigns. We see that populations are targeted and massaged into being potentials, weapons within the state or society in question. We are all quite familiar with the term fifth column. I think uh, it's a popular term that has been used for um, centuries. Hybrid warfare 
essentially targets the population into turning them into potential fifth columns. And uh, this is a particular tool within the wider toolkit of hybrid warfare, which we will see probably being employed quite a lot in the coming days. Uh, as many of you may be aware, BIPS has done uh, quite a n bit of work on disinformation and fake news, and we are about to embark on a major project in that regard. And disinformation and fake news perhaps is now the most potent and powerful tool of hybrid warfare that is being employed, where an adversary can create a parallel reality and use falsehoods to fuel social fragmentation, disorient the public, and make it difficult for the government to seek public approval to carry out many of its policies. See, in a way, an alternative reality is presented to the public through means of disinformation, fake news, and in some cases, influence operations, where the public start be believing uh, the fake news as reality. And this has been uh, employed in many countries, uh, and I think it's important for us to understand that uh, in order to be able to protect us from the employment of hybrid tactics, we have to be first aware against about disinformation. As the chair said at the beginning, the as we get more integrated into cyberspace, as we have artificial intelligence entering our lives, and then we also have the whole idea of alternate, augmented reality or AR, metaverse, and so on, and a greater integration with cyberspace, hybrid threats will become more potent and more real. Because hybrid threats blend the lethality of state conflict with the fanatical and protected fervor of irregular warfare. In such conflicts in future, adversaries, state-sponsored groups, or self-funded actors could potentially exploit access to modern military capabilities including encrypted command systems, manned portables, surface-to-air missiles, and other modern lethal systems, as well as promote protected insurgencies that employ other irregular tactics. We could potentially see states blending high-tech capabilities such as anti-satellite weapons with cyber warfare. So I think there is an interesting correlation which is emerging between what we traditionally call information warfare, cyber warfare, and some of the new hybrid tactics. So, uh, and often a mistake I uh, think we make in Bangladesh is that we are not as cyber vulnerable as some of the advanced countries are. But the reality is we are as cyber vulnerable as any advanced country because our integration is also quite significant and the new systems and infrastructure that we are developing are going to be more cyber vulnerable than ever before. So this is something, for example, we have the metro rail coming up, which is essentially going to depend on cyberspace for its smooth operation. So I think this is something we have to keep in mind that our cyber defenses have to be strong and uh, unless our cyber defenses are strong, we have a vulnerability when it comes to hybrid attacks. I'll just uh, start wrapping up here. Uh, so just to recap what I said, that it, we are looking at multiple domains and tools uh, of hybrid warfare that can be employed. Our cohesion as a society, uh, we are going to be more uh, susceptible to hybrid attacks. Because ultimately, what an adversary tries to do by employing hybrid tactics is essentially exploit the schisms that exist within a particular society. And whether we call it political warfare, whether by means of disinformation, cyber tactics, or in some cases, economic exploitation, it is ultimately the exploitations of the differences and schisms and lack of cohesion which exists within society. So these are some thoughts. I'd come back again during Q&A, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Shavko, thank you. Uh, you did explain very well how the multi-domain concept works. And states like Bangladesh or any other state is extremely vulnerable to all the tools that are being employed in hybrid warfare. You also very correctly men mentioned that in cyberspace, we are as vulnerable as any other advanced country in the world. As long as you're linked to the international cyber highway, you become all the more vulnerable. Our banking system, our water distribution, the electricity that we are using here, our telephone system, everything that we do today is cyber dependent. So therefore, our, our cyber defenses have to be adequate. I'm not too sure 
whether we have the current defenses for our cyber capabilities in Bangladesh or not. So this is an awareness that needs to be built. Our next speaker is Group Captain Zaid. Zaid, you have the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, distinguished moderators, uh, esteemed fellow pan panelists, and learned audience, assalamu alaikum and a uh, very good morning. Uh, it's always uh, very rewarding to participate in any BIPS event, uh, which I think by now has established itself as a, a dynamic hub of uh, intellectual discourse, critical thinking, and uh, also allowing the academics, professionals, and uh, mm, other uh, interested parties to uh, talk and interact on uh, contemporary issues. Uh, I hope the, the today's session will be also as exciting as it used to be. The problem of uh, being the f f last, uh, not the problem, the actually the advantage of being the last speaker is that you can either summarize what all have been said, or also uh, or are infuse something new which has not been already said. So I'll choose the later. We have heard uh, Frank Hoffman. As a, a Air Command Staff College graduate, I had the opportunity of uh, listening to him. And also a couple of days back, uh, he was uh, in another uh, webinar talking about his own concept of hybrid warfare. And um, we've also heard about Sun Tzu with Clausewitz and everything uh, that relates to um, uh, their thoughts on hybrid warfare and how it is relatable to what we have defined as hybrid warfare. It seems that hybrid warfare, the concept is all embracing. That is problematic for a researcher. Researchers need to sort of scale it down and sort of bite and put the conceptual thinking in a perspective. So one good way of doing it is to look into the Clausewitz trinity of war and then explain it from there so that the theorization of Claus, uh, hybrid warfare becomes more relevant and understandable. So in the trinity of war, there are three different forces. Clausewitz talks about three different forces. One which generates in the realm of people is primordial ha violence, hatred, and enmity, which others have defined as irrational force. The other one, the next one is the fog and friction of war, which originates in the realm of military and the commander. And this is called non-rational force. And the third is war's subjugation to policy, which most of us have articulated as war is an instrument of policy, and reason. And that is the rational force. So what has happened, I mean, if you see hybrid warfare from through these lenses, then we find that the irrational forces has dominated over non-rational and rational forces because we're talking about non-state actors, fanatic fighting styles, circumventing the norms of, uh, norms of war or laws of armed conflict in hybrid warfare. That has happened and that is why uh, hybrid, that is how if we see the hybrid warfare, then it becomes conceptually uh, understandable, much more uh, graspable. So uh, relevant to this, what is uh, more pertinent is to also pinpoint what exactly has changed in the 21st century warfare. And with a very brief comment on this, I will shift into the main, uh, another critical area that how to counter how to hybrid warfare. The first thing that has changed in the 21st century warfare that states, particularly those who are nuclear armed states, want to operate below the threshold of direct conflict. So warfare is, has become increasingly indirect. And this is evidenced by uh, the statistics uh, which is published by the uh, UCPD and also PRIO that um, there is a decline in interstate war, tremendous decline in interstate, interstate war, but there is an exponential increase in internationalized internal war, which you can also call civil wars. So uh, proxy forces, non-state actors, motivated, funded, and supported by external entities have become the main actors. 
And the second um, thing that has changed is that the non-military means of achieving political and strategic goals has grown. And in many cases, they have exceeded the power of force, of weapon, in their effectiveness. And we have heard the, uh, uh, the talk about cyberspace. It is a particular example where uh, it's a, it's a non-kinetic uh, operations, uh, which has given, which gives a certain advantage to certain nations. Third, war in this age is aimed more on creating cognitive effects as opposed to physical destructions. The aim is to change the mind of the people, and that is exactly what uh, has changed. So amidst such uh, profound changes, hybrid warfare has emerged as a tool to pursue strategic ends with a degree of force, but not such an overt use of coercion that it would cross the threshold of conventional justification for war. So with these uh, small insights about the concept and changes, let me now focus on how to fight hybrid warfare. Now, we have already established uh, pretty much that hybrid warfare cannot be fought in silos. Uh, it, it requires integration of all elements of national power for offensive and defensive operation. The aim is to develop an asymmetric edge and build capacities to fight ambiguous and amorphous adversaries by synergistic application of intelligence, information, cyber, electronic, conventional and unconventional means. We also have to remember that cyber, hybrid warfare uh, can be a prolonged conflict. It undermines institutions and we've also heard that it, its target is, is, society, is to affect the societal cohesion and it could eventually escalate into conventional war. The domains of hybrid war can spill over to kinetic and non-kinetic, traditional, non-traditional and contact and non-contact warfare. This is the reason why most countries have placed hybrid warfare capabilities under a centralized military control with political supervision. Moreover, since it deals with external adversaries, it falls in the ambit of military engagement for offensive and defensive operation. Creation of military structure to fight hybrid war assumes greater significance, especially when hybrid warfare campaign tends to be long-term, reflecting that the states are living in a period of persistent competition, confrontation, and conflict. So the starting point of building the capacity of fighting hybrid warfare is to develop a doctrine. Unfortunately, we do not have one. So it is perhaps uh, pertinent to look at the doctrine of some of our neighbors, and I have some um, insights. Uh, I'll share some insights from the Indian military doctrine. The India has both uh, joint warfare doctrine and uh, service doctrines like the Air Force doctrine and the land warfare doctrine. So I'll just, uh, for the paucity of time, I'll only highlight three aspects. First, uh, these doctrines recognize that non-contact and hybrid domains of conflict are integral part of India, India's conventional and sub-conventional operations. Accordingly, the doctrine stipulates that when India prosecutes a conventional war, and I quote, appropriate simultaneous response to hybrid and non-contact warfare will be ensured in all dimensions, at all stages, and in all sectors of conflict, unquote. Interestingly, this military doctrine uh, also mentions about coercive diplomacy, defense diplomacy, cyber power projection, perception management through information operations and identifies those, those as some of the key elements to conduct India's hybrid warfare uh, campaign and suggesting better integration of these elements to strengthen its military instrument of power. The second element in the doctrine is that it posits that the non-contact and hybrid warfare prosecuted by India could be non-declaratory and non-attributable. Something that uh, Shafkat has already touched, that uh, use of drones uh, gives a plausible deniability. India's joint doctrine also states strategic st uh, surgical strikes as a pragmatic and proactive strategy to respond against terror provocation. So such doctrinal legitimation arguably allows the military to operate below the threshold of open hostility, blurring the lines between peace and war, and circumvent the traditional norms of warfare 
all of which, as we have already established, is the characteristics of hybrid warfare. So it goes back to what Shafkat was telling that we should not consider cyber warfare as a concept which is not applicable in our context. And we'll soon find out why uh, when I talk about a little more about the Bangladesh context. So mm, uh, something about the uh, other things about the structure of how to fight uh, hybrid warfare can be also referred from uh, the Indian doctrine. They have uh, different cyber agencies, different space agencies, and special operation divisions, and often referred as the triad. Uh, this is bolstering India's hybrid warfare capacities. And for offensive operations, the cyber and space elements uh, plans the operation, and the special operation forces conduct the hybrid warfare. The doctrine also goes on suggesting that adequate capabilities will be developed to dominate the formation, uh, information domain to deal with external and internal security challenges in coordination with Yarmouk services and agencies. So these insights from the Indian military doctrine provide some idea which we can extrapolate, customize in our context, taking into consideration of our vulnerabilities, national priorities, and interest to develop our own doctrine of fighting hybrid warfare. In terms of our vulnerabilities, I'm sure uh, most of you will agree with me that our diplomatic instrument of power needs to be strengthened with credible deterrence. Diplomacy without inadequate deterrence is like a velvet glove without an iron fist. Now, developing credible deterrence is not just a function of occurring new asset but also a closer coordination, integration, and alignment of other instrument of national power. Second, we're also vulnerable to external and internal support and influence of non-state actors, particularly those engaged in violent extremism. One key non-coercive element means to combat such violent extremism and radicalism is to create a pragmatic and well-reasoned counter narrative, something that uh, the president was actually s saying in one of his recent interviews, if I'm not wrong, in, with a, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper. Several counter uh, narrative campaigns, such as uh, average Muhammad targeting the Somalian youth, exit USA targeting the far right extremists in the United States, Harkatul Talim targeting the Taliban extremist narratives promoted in Pakistan have been reportedly fostered open conversation and provided a better understanding of the target audiences promoting community cohesions. Third, our vulner vulnerability also lies on inadequate and divergent perception of what constitutes our national security concern. Despite being the second most ethnically homogeneous country after the two Koreas, our society remains bitterly divided along the political lines. Such division creates space for conducting hybrid, hybrid warfare against Bangladesh by any potential adversaries. Addressing such vulnerability would require an integrated and synchronized approach towards national security issues, and more importantly, creating eco-chambers in the cyberspace and the information domain to enlighten and align the larger population about the key national security issues. So what have we done so far in terms of uh, fighting hybrid warfare? Uh, well, in short, uh, nothing, uh, not much. But there are some encouraging signs. Uh, there is no explicit mention of hybrid warfare in our defense policy of 2018. It, however, directs the defense forces to be capable of conducting conventional and unconventional war, including cyber warfare. Uh, this is inclusive in our defense policy. The policy also directs the armed forces to develop capabilities of information warfare, control the electromagnetic spectrum in order to function effectively under information and communication technology-based threats. Now, such mentions and guidance on cyber, electromagnetic, and information domain, which essentially are integral part of cyber uh, hybrid warfare, provide scopes for capacity building. However, the guidance of our defense policy focuses only on the defensive cyber actions, ignoring the offensive potentials of cyber warfare. The 2014 cyber security strategy, which was promulgated through a government gadget, also focuses on areas like legal measures, 
uh, offshoot of this uh, um, cybersecurity strategy is the DSA. Uh, technical and procedural measures and organizational structures for cybersecurity. The, the strategy is geared towards building awareness, formulating legal regimes and defensive measures to protect national data centers and other facilities. In contrast, in more recent times, Bangladesh Armed Forces Cybersecurity Policy 2020 calls for creating a dedicated cyber force and to promulgate a declarative policy for fighting hybrid, warf uh, hybrid warfare. This will facilitate the uh, in defense forces to acquire assets and also uh, prepare their doctrine. As per this policy, a cyber force uh, should be formed to support cyber warfare, counter cyber warfare, and cyber security issues. This force may also combat cyber terrorism to establish cyber power projection. The composition of the force should be a mix of civil and military personnel and grouped into six uh, wings like cyber defense, cyber offense, and cyber security coordination tasks. But this is still in, in, a, in, a, disc, uh, in a policy level. So it, uh, not much has been done except establishing few uh, uh, directorates in the service headquarter levels for cyber warfare. So Bangladesh's progress in cyber security is encouraging to some extent and according to the 2020 Global Cyber Security Index which measures the commitment of countries to cyber security, Bangladesh ranked 53rd out of 182 countries and 11th in the Asia Pacific region. If we can translate our aspirational policy into capacities, Bangladesh can have an edge on the cyber warfare domain and I fully agree with uh, Shafkat that uh, emerging facilities like the um, uh, uh, metro rail and others which will be uh, key nodal points for cyber and vulnerability will increase for cyber attacks. Another encouraging and affordable tool to develop our hybrid warfare fighting capacity would be acquiring combat drones associated technologies. Uh, recently uh, the military has already acquired some of the shelf combat drones and several projects to produce such drones through technology transfer is in hand. However the current steps to develop our kinetic and non-kinetic capability to prosecute or counter hybrid, hybrid warfare is very meager and lacks integration. As highlighted before, combating hybrid warfare threats requires whole of government response that combines all national instrument of power. Our strategy to counter, our, uh, counter or retaliate hybrid warfare threats should, system, should be systemic and well integrated. I do have a few more uh, uh, points on the on how we should have build a, a strategy for uh, cyber uh, for fighting the uh, for countering the uh, hybrid warfare, which I can discuss during um, uh, during the question and answer session. But uh, suffice to say that that this should have three elements: is uh, respond, deter, and defend. We can elaborate on these uh, in, in, the, in the subsequent uh, Q&As. But to conclude, fighting a hybrid war requires research, information, communications, and integration of resources <coughs> under a defined centralized authority. If such complex warfare lacks direction, control, and focus, it can be chaotic. And if not dealt professionally, it can become a major challenge to the national security, combating Hybrid warfare also requires a degree of political military coordination because such warfare can break out unexpectedly during peacetime. Hybrid operations should have the capabilities to engage with state, society, and infrastructure simultaneously. A synchronized and integrated approach that allows a prudent and inclusive use of the elements of national power is the way forward to fight hybrid war. Thank you. Thank you, Zaid. Thank you, Zaid. You explained that very well, especially on the tools of countering hybrid threats. And as you can imagine that, like any other country, Bangladesh is vulnerable, and we are falling short of our preparatory works that we need to do in peacetime. The lines between peace and war is blurred here in cyber warfare and also in hybrid warfare. So therefore, we are always in hybrid environment. 
So it can break out even during peace and it is very difficult to identify when it has broken out. So those are the vulnerabilities that we live in. But with that, we will now open the floor for your questions and comments. I will have first Ambassador Shamim, then sir, I will come to you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this event. Uh, I've heard of, uh, with a lot of interest the presentation so far from the panel. So I don't claim much knowledge, and in fact, I don't know much about hybrid war or cyber war. I have heard a great deal. Uh, my question would be more out of curiosity. I mean, one is uh, I haven't really heard any concrete example of from any of the of the presentations of an intense uh, hybrid war between two states, between two state actors, like you would refer to many intense battles in, in military history, like the Battle of Al Alameen or the Indo-Pak Wars. So can you cite uh, one or two cases where uh, there have been intense hybrid war between two, state act two states currently or in the past, for my better understanding? And another uh, sort of uh, reference to our uh, metro system, which would be inaugurated possibly on the 28th, running the risk of being uh, affected by hybrid war, it really sort of stoked my curious mind, and it was possibly Mr. Shafkat who referred to that, and I would like to uh, have the benefit of some elaboration from it. And another thing is, in case of an intense hybrid war, I mean, what did you expect between two state actors? What did you expect the population to do? I mean, like in case of a conventional war, I mean, when there's an air attack, we should run to the trenches, you know. And another thing is, I would like to hear from any of the panelists, uh, how can a hybrid war get more intense in an intra-state conflict in an event where the conflict is basically triggered by the acts of the government of the day? Thank you. Thank you for excellent questions. And in addition to what you said that you don't understand the warfare, every single citizen is a hybrid warrior. You as a diplomat, you are as much a warrior as I am as a former soldier. Uh, the, one of the biggest uh, vulnerability in cyberspace that is increasingly coming to Bangladesh is our nuclear power plant that we are building in Rupur. So we better gear up our abilities and capabilities because that is extremely cyber vulnerable. Hmm. So we have, <laughs> as one of our panelists just reminded me that we have already had a physical attack on our central bank from the cyberspace. So you can imagine how vulnerable we have in, in fact become. And we will now go to you, sir, for your comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's lovely to be uh, back here again. Uh, I would uh, make some comments, yes, and uh, the idea of making these comments would be to make the discussions a little hybrid. I mean, we have a very intensely military or largely military panel, uh, largely, largely military <laughs> panel, <laughs> and, uh, 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 and this would be a civilian input into, uh, in, into the discussions, I hope. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, all three of them, Zahir, Shafkat, and Zahid, have, have made excellent, ex presented excellent papers. Uh, I would like to sort of react to, uh, starting from what uh, you began, uh, uh, General Munir, uh, with your remarks with regard to 5G. Now, 5G, of course, refers to the fifth generation yes. uh, uh, of, of warfare, and this is, a, uh, I think the expression was first coined, or at supposed to have been coined by Robert Steele in a, in a, in a talk in 2003, I think, uh, though it was contested contested. But I'd like to sort of discuss a little on how sort of, so you need to give me a few minutes, as to how it evolved up to, uh, to uh, fifth generation from the beginning. But before that, to respond a little to, uh, to uh, uh, Shamim, uh, the Hezbollah war that, that uh, Munir had referred to uh, was indeed a hybrid war. And, and in fact, uh, Arkela and Ronfeld, uh, we made a lot of reference to, of course, uh, uh, Frank Hoffman, 
Frank Kaufman's key piece here is network-centric warfare, some cautionary thoughts. Yeah. That was his, his, his article. But Arkelia and Ronfeld drew from the, uh, from the Hezbollah uh, method of war fighting, which comprised uh, small dispersed groups who communicate, uh, coordinate, and conduct their uh, campaigns in an internetted manner without precise central command. So, so uh, that was the beginning of what, uh, what they called networks and cyber war. And in fact, the piece was called Networks and Works and Cyber War, uh, uh, war are coming to the world or some, something, something, something like that. Now, the evolution of the five generations. The first generation, of course, of course, as you would expect, would be the ancient and medieval Roman legions, I mean, who came in cohorts and lines and columns. Uh, and uh, uh, they had their weaponry uh, designed in consonance with the evolution of the sort of Roman culture. Uh, uh, apart from the arrows, of course, they had the long spears, which were called the pylums. The spears were about seven feet long, so that it bent on impact. You see, so that the it was an intelligent spear because the other party could not throw it back at you. Smart spear. S smart spear. <laughs> smart spear. So uh, they developed the smart uh, sm smart uh, uh, spear. So so uh, uh, war was a uh, straightforward, orderly. Uh, it was a straightforward, orderly means of waging waging war. Now uh, this lasted actually through almost through uh, from the ancient time through 1648 to the first great. Great War. 1648 is what created, as we know, the state system in, 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 in Europe. Yes. But prior to that, you know, these armies comprised these religious groups and all that sort of thing. And when the Thirty Years' War was fought, the states began to emerge, nation states began to emerge, and uh, we had these sort of uniformed uh, uh, soldiers belonging to the state. Uh, fi fighting for the for, for, for the nation state, so that was the beginning of the uh, uh, first generation, which blended into the second generation of warfare, which is roughly around say 1860, 1860 to the first Great War. Uh, now the second generation, uh, the war was still uh, battle fighting was still linear. Uh, you use muskets, uh, muskets, and. The Lanchester model came into being. La Lanchester model is a mathematical uh, formulae. Uh, very crudely put, it's that uh, numbers being equal, superior firepower wins, mm -hmm. you see? And then you sort of, you have mathematical models built on that. You see distance uh, uh, aimed or non-aimed uh, uh, firing, etc. So basically, you had longer range, it involved longer range, greater accuracy, and faster rate of, rate, rate of fire. Then you had the third, third generation, uh, which was non-linear. You went behind the enemy lines, because by that time aircraft had come into existence, so you were able to go behind the uh, uh, airlines and uh, uh, enemy and use sort of uh, long-range shelling uh, and to air force uh, to, to do that. Uh, what comes to mind in this generation is the Blitzkrieg, of course, the famous Blitzkrieg, which was actually uh, developed by, as you know, the Germans. But uh, Heinz uh, uh, Gudermann, uh, Guderian, sorry, Guderian, uh, I think his, his work was called uh, Achtung Panzer. He was, a, he was a signals officer who took a lot of interest in tanks. He did a lot of study on tank antics. So what he developed, the Blitzkrieg, was a combination of tank, Aircraft and radio, and radio and yeah, a, com a combination of the three. And speed and maneuverability were the sort of uh, uh, stratagem. In, th in other words, the idea was sort of uh, overcome technological di disadvantage through clever strategy. You see, so that was the idea. Then the fourth generation, which is the current uh, decentralized form of warfare. We spoke about this, of course, non-state actors. Uh, uh, both uh, kinetic and non-kinetic actions. Now, interestingly, fourth generation, uh, you see, it was said, uh, it has been said, that uh, e e even during the Punic Wars, they had something like a fourth generation which led, uh, 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 led uh, uh, Pliny the Elder to famously say, uh, uh, 
ex Africa semper ubiquis nova, out of Africa will always emerge something new, you see, because they, they had these, uh, uh, both a combination of, of uh, civilians and, and, and uh, military uh, fighting the war. Fifth generation, what you referred to, uh, uh, General Munir, is w w when actually uh, uh, Robert Steele made, made uh, coined that expression, he was challenged, saying that he was, if this was 2000, and three, that it was too soon, I mean, uh, too soon perhaps. Maybe it was then, but no longer. But this had to do with futuristic, mostly non-kinetic actions, such, a, such as social engineering, disinformation campaigns, uh, uh, use of IT, uh, a AI, artificial intelligence, weaponry, gray zone warfare, such as psychological information warfare, cyber warfare, omnipresent battle space. I mean, uh, battleground becomes battle space, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and all domains uh, are brought into action. Now, you see, eventually you see, what happens is that uh, they say that uh, uh, any sufficiently developed technology is in, in fact becomes a bit like magic. Magic, but the thesis. I mean, this, you, you all made a mention of San Tzu, and uh, his point was all warfare is based on deception, and this was th uh, so many thousand years ago. So my thesis is basically we are going back to the same thing. Yes. I mean, to deceiving the enemy and using the human intelligence in order to be able to do so. So the ultimate thesis being that it's man's ingenuity. It's still the general, still the leader, uh, still the man who has to decide when to pull the trigger, uh, set the AI in motion, or to, or to press the button. So the ingenuity of, of the human, human mind is important. And uh, uh, obviously, so it, it was rightly said that uh, man's uh, uh, grasp, uh, reach should exceed his grasp, what else are the heavens for? I thank you. Thank you. Excellent points and a lot of food for thought. But the only issue here are two that I take from your deliberations is that with increased autonomous platforms, the man's ingenuity probably may be in decline at some times because autonomous platforms can take autonomous decisions now. The other point is both Shavkat and Zayed did mention that we are operating in pre-threshold environment. So one of the biggest difficulties in pre-threshold environment is that we are without any legal cover. The laws of war, we have a colleague from ICRC, he can explain it better than me, that the laws of armed conflict do not apply here. So we are operating in a vacuum while all forms of <coughs> actions are not covered by any international law or legal system. And that's something that worries everybody. So I now go to our former Foreign Secretary, Tawhi Uh Thank you. We have had uh, quite an elaborate and uh, very enlightening discussion on the uh, mostly theoretical aspect, but also some applicability of those. Um, uh, Shanghai actually wanted to know some examples. Well. Um, people could disagree with me, but the Bangladesh Liberation War, at least till September, was a hybrid war. And uh, non attributable. India never agreed that it's helping in arming or uh, doing things till at least July. Uh, and uh, the basic test was that there will be a, a frontal conflict someday but to weaken and uh, disorient the enemy before that. And they did it very successfully. And the uh, freedom fighters were instrumental in the ultimate victory. Um, about the going back, Hassan Sabba, the name strikes, 11th century, the Hashishis. They introduced assassination. The name came from there. Association as a political instrument. Yeah. And they reached up to the bedroom of Salah bin Ayubi. They could do that. There was a, uh, you know, a, a knife planted on his pillow. They could have killed him, meaning that they could have killed him, putting pressure on him to concede certain things. And he succumbed to that. It was a hybrid affair. 
Bangladesh at this moment is victim of a hybrid warfare. <coughs> Myanmar has sent in a million refugees on us, almost without impunity. They have not paid any price for that. Um, offering economic gains to others, economic strategic gains <laughs> to others, they have had very important friends in the, person, in the, in the uh, guys of China and Russia, to some extent even India, Japan. Waste also, they are investing there. And they don't want to take, nobody wants to take any action against Myanmar because they have gains to make. So that is another. Cyberspace. Um, you go in and you see much more of the Myanmar's position on the Rohingya issues than the position of the, uh, of the victims in the cyberspace. They are doing it better than us, better than the, we have not done much about it. There is scope for it. We have spoken about it, that there is a lot of scope for us. We have a huge population and many of them are quite uh, technology savvy. We just have to just uh, get that resource to work, to actually uh, dislodge Myanmar on many fronts. We can do that if we just uh, have the right policy. Uh, pushing drugs into Bangladesh. Sorry? Drugs. drugs. Okay. And the victims of the genocide uh, are being used by the uh, genocidal regime to do it. And um, projecting the victims at, as terrorists. So on all these fronts, a cyber warfare or a, a, a hybrid warfare is going on. And uh, I don't know how much we are doing to save ourselves, to defend ourselves. Thank you. Yes, you do point out a very interesting point that crimes and different crime techniques is a hybrid technique. And that's where you're pointing out. Also the fact that we are operating in the gray zone. And the, in the gray zone, a lot of things are not very clear. We need to identify the threats very explicitly so that you can have countermeasures to meet the threats. The gray zone warfare, as we know it today, in the hybrid domain, is a very complex space where things are blurred, that's why it's gray. Where you, it's difficult to identify the threat and the perpetrators. It is a space where people can almost operate with impunity, as you rightly point out. And those are the vulnerabilities we need to identify. So we have our professor or teacher from Dhaka University, Tanvir. Um. Uh, thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak. Um, a very timely issue in terms of Bangladesh and how it might impact us. I believe acknowledgement of a problem is the first step towards a solution. So looking back at uh, human history, I believe societies, when they have engaged in any kinds of conflict, has always looked for any power asymmetries that they could gain. So once we tried to tame animals, we got the idea of mobility and then the chariots and everything came about. So this is not a very new phenomenon that we see, just an addition of dimensions. We often tend to be overwhelmed by the novel concepts of AI or let's say various other dimensions, but we need to understand that as we modernize and um, as we tend to add more dimensions to our own lives, so using cyberspace, using AI to augment reality and other stuff, those aspects are always going to be targeted by actors who t try to overcome their power asymmetry. We need to understand that generally hybrid warfare or this kind of warfares are, although being termed as non-Trinitarian warfare or non clausewitzian warfare, but these are in effect, the recourse to hybrid warfare is in effect a very rational choice. Most often than not, it is, it is a strategy of countries that tend to have a power symmetry that is skewed against them. So if you could win a warfare in a linear conventional war, you would not be approaching hybrid warfare to begin with. And the second reason why countries go to hybrid warfare is the plausible deniability, which I believe we have talked about. And the third reason is a cost-benefit 
uh, aspect of the strategy to begin with because that allows you a large degree of um, influence without <coughs> having to spend a lot of money in conventional warfare. So I believe understanding that would require us to go back into the Russian concept of mass Koryovka, which initially talked in terms of operational, which later on got into a strategic um, effect, but now it has been taken into information domain as well. So understanding those concepts would declutter a lot of these issues for us. Approaches to hybrid warfare, regardless of the fact that it is uh, mostly talked about in terms of warfare and a military led one, but a response to that might have been, might be in terms of a more civilian led approaches. Democracies in general tend to be um, less powerful in their responses to this because their domestic makeup is divisionary. That is how they are supposed to be. Dissent is something that we cherish in democracy. As such, most democracies, what they do is using a very strong, centralized and effective national security council, they tend to deal with national security problems. That is perhaps an institutional mechanism we are still missing in Bangladesh. Approach to that perhaps would lead us to a better understanding that we might respond to that. So in order to understand or in order to respond to these problems, we need to understand that in a two-step model of media or narrative or information warfare, however you want to call it, nodal points in the society which we call as opinion shapers in society are important aspects of this hybrid warfare campaign. So once you understand the logistics of the problem, then you would understand that a lot of that could be targeted at their uh, very root without having to recourse to major um, you know, cost or major uh, escalation in our fields as well. So despite the fact that we talk of hybrid warfare in terms of mostly short term effects or mostly in tactical aspects, but hybrid warfare strategy is a long term aspect as well. That's where the gray zone strategy comes in. So countries would over a long period of time try to shape the narratives or understandings or thought process of their opponents or the targeted communities. And that would require a lot of logistical efforts behind the scene in trying to shape the narratives in real time or in trying to shape uh, narratives of this public opinion shapers through a process of intimidation or using other methods. And that would fall under the purview of a properly functioning counterintelligence operation. So these are not issues that cannot be targeted. Moreover, counter narrative is in effect and essentially a civilian led affair. So that is something we need to acknowledge as well. because. It requires a large degree of flexibility in terms of how you approach the problem to begin with. And that would require a much more flexible approach to this issue, which I don't think in a technical military affair we would find that to begin with. So engaging both sides of the spectrum, civilian and military, I believe if you understand and if you have a focused way of approaching this issue, Bangladesh can respond to that, regardless of which domain we are fighting, whether it's cyber or information campaign or in the next domain that we add to our lifestyle. So that is how we probably might approach this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Tanvir. Uh, completely agreed, agree with whatever you're saying. One thing we did not talk here today is the very power and the use of data integrity, which is again a very, very vulnerable front of hybrid warfare. With data corruption, you can degrade a nation's capacity to wage war. And that is extremely important today because Everything is data dependent. Zahid did mention that safeguarding data centers. So it goes back on not only to saving the data centers, but data creation, data integrity, data expansions. Everything is data dependent, data driven. And that is a very, very useful fund. But the, one of the most active ways of doing influence operation, doing information operation, or any sort of manipulation is in the media domain. And that is perhaps one of the biggest spaces in hybrid warfare. So we would like to listen to Aisha Kabir for her comments because she's the editor of Protomalo English Web. Uh, thank you, General Munir. I was just thinking when I was listening to all of the deliberations that as the media, as a media person, I was feeling that uh, as the media, how very vulnerable we are, uh, the media as a whole, to be sucked in knowingly or unknowingly into this hybrid war which exists globally, not only as victims but also as perpetrators. We can be willing or unwilling perpetrators without knowing simply because of ignorance. So I think it's extremely important, in fact, just 
today listening to this, all of your deliberations, I realize just how very important it is for the media people, the members of the media, to be very aware of this hybrid warfare which is all around it. Because we just hear about the terms hybrid war, we know vaguely about it. But I think this is this requires much more than just awareness, but active understanding, active application in our profession. Because we can be unwilling or, un, or ignorant participants or perpetrators by just even publishing an innocu seemingly innocuous article or whatever. So I was also one, wanting to question that is there any Inst Tanvir was mentioning the need of an institution, a central institution. Do we have, because hybrid warfare is such a thing as all of you were saying, it's not from today, it's from ancient times, but every day it's growing more and more sophisticated. Every time we meet a challenge or we understand it, something more sophisticated or uh, more technological is coming up, harder and harder to combat. So do we have any institution in Bangladesh, I'm meaning, who keeps up with what is going on in this cyber warfare or hybrid war? What is going on? What are the developments? How can we constantly combat it? How can we com uh, keep up with it? Is there any institution that is doing research on this where um, on a national level, not just on a private level? So where we in the media or any other institution where we can also be educated, also be, you know, come to know and come to understand it? Because we don't have workshops like this or roundtables like this every day, so is there any institution where we could, which could help us, particularly as a media person, I'm saying, help us understand this, help us combat it, help us avoid becoming perpetrators or victims of this? Thank you, Aisha. We'll now go to Rust for your question or comment. Uh, what Aisha has said, I am also a journalist, though I had been a military officer for a uh, shorter period. Yes, uh, all around the world, the governments are raising hybrid warfare against the journalists, against media. We cannot deny the fact. Uh, so you, we have to face every day these things. And what uh, she says uh, and suggested about something, some sort of institutions that, uh, that can educate us about something, how we are going to achieve it, especially in Bangladesh. Because in Bangladesh, everything is termed uh, in political sense and said whether you are with us or you are against us. So there, in the media also there are uh, problems, so we cannot just achieve it in that way. However, we have uh, uh, what uh, Shapkat and uh, General Johir and uh, Group Captain Jahid has referred about few uh, specialists. I will refer uh, Chanokko, probably he is one of the uh, veterans. He said that instigation of treachery in the target country nation or enemy camp is a <coughs> very uh, well thought means to raise hybrid warfare or non-conventional warfare. And uh, Bangladesh probably is a uh, say perfect example of that, what already a uh, few of them has ma have mentioned. I will ask few questions to uh, Shapkat. Uh, Shapkat has uh, mentioned about uh, uh, instead of loan or economic coercion by some uh, powers. And I will ask that, uh, do you think the, uh, these mega projects of something, then connectivity of something, those who are going on in our uh, region or around the world, you can term this as uh, the say, means of hybrid warfare? Uh, and uh, to General Joy, sir, do you think, sir, that uh, hybrid warfare once fought among the countries that it may instigate or welcome full-scale war in a bigger perspective or even nuclear war, what we are anticipating for Russia and Ukraine war. Is there any possibility or actually this hybrid warfare instigating this, say for Iran, <coughs> for their proxies, they are raising hybrid warfare uh, through Hezbollah, Hamas in uh, Lebanon, in Israel, in Gaza Strip, in Iraq, in Syria. Do you think the other countries may retaliate as we have seen recently, the Saudi minister uh, uh, in uh, Abu Dhabi or in Dubai, he commented that we want surety from the uh, world. Otherwise, all bets are off if uh, Iran gets the nuclear weapon. So, so 
this is going to be a question uh, for the future. And what uh, Group Captain Jahid just mentioned I, uh, the, about, the, about our Bangladeshi society, yes, I wrote a book in 2003 uh, titled National Security and Armed Forces, where interviews of 23 generals uh, are included. There I mentioned this thing uh, in details, but I would say only that in Bangladesh, 98.7% population are Bengali speaking. Bengali. So, so we should have better say homogeneity, social homogeneity, but we don't have. Due to political reasons, political purposes, we have destroyed it, whether you agree or not. And uh, political vulnerability and absence of social homogeneity, I think, uh, made us most vulnerable. And how to counter it? And uh, oh no, what Sar has said and uh, uh, Mr. Tohid has said that Myanmar is already raising some sort of hybrid warfare against us. How to counter it? If you don't have social homogeneity, you will be always our, how to counter it means our, we require a strong defense, we require our strong intelligence system, this and that. The how they will counter it? If we have social problems, social vulnerability, political vulnerability, we have observed for years together, not only during this government, during other governments too, that our politic, our intelligence organizations are being used mainly for political purposes against the political opponents. So this reduces their capacities, their capabilities. We have fine brand of officers there. They are well trained, but they are 24-7 busy about politics. So if we don't stop it, we cannot achieve this mission. And if we stop it and we can uh, enhance their capacities, we can give them more training, we can uh, bring out, uh, bring in some good partners, foreign partners or anyone, then I think it can be achieved. And the last point is that there is one thing, Jahid, Group Captain Jahid, do you think that inciting religious sentiment is a tool of hybrid warfare, especially what we see in Afghanistan, in Iran, in some areas of Pakistan, even in Bangladesh and some other areas of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question or comment will be from Merlin Boom. Uh, he is an instructor of the U.S. Army's Military Academy at West Point and also a doctoral candidate at Princeton University. You have the floor. Great, thank you, sir, uh, for having me today, and thank you to the distinguished panel uh, for speaking with us. Uh, I'd like to make comments in two specific areas. First, I think when we talk about hybrid war, it's important to consider the scope of what we're talking about. So when we talk about hybrid war, it can encompass everything, or it can encompass a specific sector or a region. So I think that's something that we should dedicate more attention to as we try to define and analyze this problem. Uh, in tandem with that, I think it's important to identify the effects of these hybrid operations. Otherwise, we're looking at a pretty sprawling problem, and we don't really have a, an effective way to allocate resources or capabilities. So uh, given these, um, these two comments on scope and effects, I'd like to focus in uh, for the second part of my comments on economic hybrid warfare or economic hybrid initiatives. Uh, and so I think that some of these perspectives we've discussed today include the negative sides of economic coercion or economic warfare. But I think it's also important to discuss economic inducements and economic positive developments and to understand how that can shape and change the modern operating environment. And so I'd like to present to the panel a question perhaps. Within Bangladesh, how do we understand economic inducements? Is there a national mechanism or a national security element that understands and tries to analyze the effects, whether political or security, that may be a result of some of these types of operations? Thank you. Thank you, Merlin. Uh, like all of our on tables, we have our young students from the university. Our last question, we'll, I'll go back to them to ask their question. Please introduce yourself and then ask the question. Thank you. Good morning. I am Nisha Tanjum Shemanti from Dhaka University. I am studying Peace and Conflict Studies, fourth year. As it's very relevant to our academics, I have a question like when you were talking about hybrid war, mentioned disinformation, cyber attacks, economic pressure, 
and the uh, less and trust between government and its people. So, is it indicate third world or developing country are more in risk uh, in hybrid? Or? And another one, uh, we know anywhere changes the world polarity. Hybrid world, uh, you mentioned is multi-dimensional. Is there any chance when in any hybrid world, the world polarity will change drastically? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, Okay, please, we are about to finish, so please ask a short question. Right, sir. Uh, I'm Khairul Hassan, a retired colonel of Bangladesh Army. Uh, at the outset, I thank and congratulate all the panelist speakers and the moderator for their excellent deliberations, which have educated us. My question will be to Mr. Shafkat Munir, who has so eloquently explained to us the domains, tools, and techniques of uh, hybrid war. Uh, Mr. Munir, as you know, as you have said, one of the tools to achieve success in a hybrid war is to exploit the schisms that exist in the society. We all know that Bangladesh population, despite its homogeneity, have a big schism that keeps the society widely divided into two distinctly opposing camps. The enmity between them is phenomenal and seems eternal. This schism shadows all other schisms of our society. How vulnerable do you think we are in case of a possible or already ongoing hybrid war, particularly on this point? And lastly, I would like to thank Ms. Aisha Kabir for her excellent question, which is my question also. I hope the answers to her question will educate me equally, if not more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any last minute thoughts before we go back to our panelists? Yes, please. Would you also please introduce yourself? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Mohammed Sanwar Hussain, uh, SP Operation and Terrorism Unit. Okay. So I just want to share something uh, on police point of view yes. as we deal with the mm, domestic issues. Um, uh, when we deal with uh, terrorism, then uh, we have to uh, work on cyber issues also. We also work on cyber security. So we have a big uh, cyber patrolling team. They are working for 24 hours. Each and every morning, uh, they submit their 24 hours report. So <coughs> what happened uh, in our country now, that when the terrorism uh, are now under control, so the people who think about it, this in Bangladesh or outside of Bangladesh, they are very much active in the online. <coughs> uh, we found that uh, if anything happened in our country, suppose uh, political or development or financial or something, uh, the terrorists are using all the things uh, from their side, and they're using that kind of thing as propaganda to hit the country. <laughs> uh, maybe something uh, coming from outside as a political uh, point of view, but in maximum cases, we found that the, um, the terrorists are doing, doing the things, and they're using the graphical data and graphical presentations, uh, that kind of thing. So my uh, observation is that uh, to uh, confront that, uh, uh, I mean, hybrid warfare, uh, we, we must need a doctrine that how we face this kind of thing. And there should be two ways. Number one is uh, hard approach and one is soft approach. So what we are doing now, uh, we are facing that kind of uh, narratives by using some counter narratives. And other ways, we're using the legal issues. And we are removing the links. We're counting the links, how many shares, where from is coming, who are doing that. So we're using our capacity, I mean cyber capacity. Uh, we're using uh, 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 the, uh, our stakeholders who are, who are using this kind of, on, I mean promoting this kind of thing. And uh, in other ways, we're, we're using some um, non-governmental, uh, non-government, I mean, organization to produce that kind of narrative so that uh, we the people, we pull 
police or government are not saying that kind of thing. We are using the public or any intellectuals to say that kind of thing. So uh, that's all about from our side. So I think uh, the hybrid warfare is mostly now, uh, uh, I mean, a a against the people to allure them to the terrorism and to allure them to think about the process of the government, something like that. So uh, the, uh, this can be, this could be more uh, vulnerable in the future. So this is the time to prepare for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very pertinent comment and question, both. So. I thank you for your wonderful and excellent questions and your thoughts. I shall now go back to our panel and we'll start with Jal Zahir. I want to bring in some uh, things that we have not discussed much. Uh, it's, it's not that um, uh, we are not good at uh, prosecuting uh, hybrid warfare. I think much has advanced in that. But I think uh, we have not given much thought as to how to end this war uh, and, and how to get out of this war. Uh, and, and as we say that that's how this, has be, this hybrid wars, as we see, that has been in, 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 in Palestine, then Syria, Iraq, Libya, and now in Ukraine, and there are many uh, other parts of the world. See, these are protected, uh, and, 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 and there is no side for any solution to these problems. So I think there is a lot to be done, a uh, lot for the academics and others to really um, give a sort of model as to how uh, this hybrid war can be brought to an end, really. The glaring thing is that um, United Nations is very much ineffective uh, in, in hybrid scenario and hybrid war. As we see that uh, they are ineffective in Syria, they are ineffective in Iraq, they are ineffective in Ukraine, and, 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 and this is, a, I think, um, a weakness actually, of the global community that we cannot come together uh, when it comes to big powers, I think United Nations is zero. Uh, I was a part of United Nations, and I have seen it from within. And, and I think uh, I think United Nations become helpless when the big powers are involved in such warfare. Again, my comment is that uh, it will be a little blunt, uh, but uh, I think this hybrid warfare, what or, or the fourth fifth generation warfare, fourth generation warfare, what we say, these are the creation of the big powers, or at least that can be blamed for flame, fanning the flames in, in, in potential areas and to create hybrid warfare. And this is to, what, to their national interest and national security interest, and sometimes also of economic interest. And we have not really thought about uh, what happens when nations get allured by big powers to engage in hybrid warfare. Like, for example, what is happening to Ukraine? You see, the country is being destroyed. And if this continues for people, it will be going back to the Stone Age. And, and, and as, as Iraq has gone to, as Syria has gone to, as Libya has gone to, so who is going to reconstruct these countries? Who is going to reconstruct these societies? We, we don't have an answer for these things. Coming back to you, you see, end of, after the end of Cold War, uh, so it was unipolarity. When we say unipolarity, it is the Western club, really. So where you see USA, there you see Western Europe. There you see Canada. There you see Australia. So, so, so that is in one side. The world now has, uh, um, like the Russian club, the Chinese club, and then now the Indian club. Uh, so, so, so the club surrounding these few countries. And multipolarity is being allowed as long as it is benign uh, mm -hmm. and it is of the interest to the Western club. 
when the other multipolarity you see it wants to grow and it comes in conflict or in tension with the with the ethos and with the ideology and with the concepts that the western espouse then there is a clash and that's what you see the run happening in ukraine now so i think uh, i think how to really end the only question is if world redefines interests once again if the if world defines if even the secretary realm or the if interest what is interest what is national interest if that is defined a national interest is not a national interest if it harms some others and if it is not a global interest it's a not a common interest for others if we can become that benign i think then we can have a way to get out of this sort of conflicts and i don't know uh, whether we are at all willing to do that thank you very much zay thank you very much uh, i shall now go to shafkat for his last comments or an answer to the questions posed to him uh, thank you chair i think i'll first tackle the questions that have been directly posed to me uh, going back to ambassador shamim's question about the example of metro rail rail i was using the metro rail as an illustration of our of our overall cyber vulnerability because i think there is uh, one thing i have always struggled with when we work on cyber security at bips is a common perception that exists in society that because we are not uh, our broadband internet penetration is still lower than advanced countries we are not cyber vulnerable and that is not true whether we talk about the metro rail whether we talk about the nuclear power plant or all other new infrastructure that has come about the cyber vulnerability is quite high and we have heard from others as well like how we can address some of those cyber vulnerabilities because it's not just cyber attacks we heard about the bangladesh bank heist but there are other new techniques which have developed by which you can render a platform unusable through cyber attack. going to the point about mega projects or i think my friend marlin very rightly uh, <coughs> pointed out about economic inducements this is a major challenge not just for us but for all societies and i think uh, the onus is on the country which is taking the loan the onus is on the country which is implementing the mega projects because if you are vulnerable to corruption if you don't have right practices in place then others will always try to exploit you so rather than blaming the uh, adversary we need to plug our own gaps first and i think the broader question that many people have raised about our based on the point that i made about our the schism that exists in our society i think that's a fundamental question uh, as a society we uh, are perhaps one of the most homogeneous in the world after the koreas but the reality of the day is that we remain bitterly divided and we cannot agree on some fundamental principles that govern our state we cannot agree on what our threats are we cannot agree on what our ideals and values are so unless those questions are addressed unless those plugs are gapped uh, gaps are plugged so uh, we will always be vulnerable to attack and exploitation i believe uh, this is the first ever seminar round table workshop on hybrid war ever to take place in bangladesh if i'm not wrong so to answer uh, ms aisha kubis question we will continue to work on this subject at bips uh, as you know we are working quite a lot on disinformation and fake news we are about to start a large country wide project but this is an area that we will continue to work on because i am of the strong belief that we need to understand these threats i also think uh, going back to tanvir's point about national security council and structures and decision making we also have to radically reimagine our military education and training because the threats on which we are educating our next generation of officers uh, are still uh, pretty much based on the threats we were talking about 30 or 40 years ago we have to completely radically reimagine how we look at uh, the concept of threats how we look at uh, responses and how we look at our doctrine as well i'm very heartened that our colleague from um, anti terrorism unit from bangladesh police has brought about the issue of cyber radicalization as you know i mean i work on this issue for many years uh <clears throat> this is an area where we have to spend a lot more energy we have to spend a lot more resources in upping our defenses against online radicalization because uh if 
we are able to uh, curtail the activities of terrorists on terra pharma, they are going to operate more and more in cyberspace, and that's where we need to be very careful about. And I think we also uh, need to look at how we design our doctrine when it comes to hybrid threats as well, because I think uh, former Foreign Secretary Mr. Tohid Hussain has talked about some of the tools that Myanmar has employed. There is, we are not uh, classifying them as hybrid threats yet, but we have to look at our uh, doctrine and to see how we can look into some of these threats and whether we are already the uh, victim of a hybrid attack. And ultimately, I think I would like to end by quoting uh, Farid Zakaria, who had once said that the ultimate counterterrorism tool, and this can be applicable for other hybrid threats as well, is uh, social resilience. If we are not terrorized, they do not win. Thank you. But a very pertinent question posed <coughs> by our police colleague is that about a hybrid doctrine, both offensive and defensive for Bangladesh. We don't have one at the moment. And this is a key takeaway from the discussion that Bangladesh needs to develop its hybrid doctrine, and it is not the military's job. It's a multi multi-sectoral input that has to go into it, because everybody is a warrior here. Thank you very much, sir. I'll uh, straightway go into the questions first, and then uh, if we have time, maybe some brief comment. The first. The question that came from one of our students here, uh, if I understood it correctly, it's just third world is, uh, is, is the third world more at risk on th hybrid warfare and will the world polarity change? Now, uh, there in the literature of hybrid warfare, there is, of course, a matrix which you can find, and NATO also uses some matrix to, uh, to sort of assess a country's vulnerability to hybrid, war hybrid threats. So if, if you want, I can also share it with you. But uh, uh, it doesn't sort of define uh, the countries in terms of third world, first world. It, the vulnerability could be uh, from any, anything, as we have seen. Uh, uh, the most powerful nation in the world also had uh, some social divisions and uh, attacks on their parliaments. So uh, this is not completely related to these, uh, the, the order in which we sort of uh, put uh, uh, the uh, countries in, in, in global ranking. Uh, it is more about the, as uh, Shafkat was saying uh, in his last comment, that social resilience, how much resilience uh, resilient is the society? Because at the heart of the hybrid warfare is attack on the social cohesion, mind, cognitive domain. So uh, to bring a strategic effect that will incite the population either against for against the existing government or towards another external government. So that is one thing. And the other question, probably polarity change will not be an issue of uh, hybrid warfare. Uh, it, it probably has a, uh, uh, its root, change of polarity has a much more deeper root on other geostrategic sort of uh, priorities. So you can consider hybrid warfare in the womb of fifth generation warfare which will eventually evolve in some day, and we'll no more talk about this as a hy hybrid warfare. We'll, we'll probably invent another name. So that's that's uh, uh, one area. The, uh, the, the question, uh, the comments about Marlin. Yes, that is exactly uh, the, the sort of defining the scope and effect, uh, sort of uh, uh, making it manageable research question. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, if you have seen, I, I was just pointing out that we do. Uh, one of the ways to sort of limiting the scope could be uh, uh, what does hybrid warfare do in terms of uh, national security, social cohesion, and the, what effects it has. And that could be an area where from we could sort of uh, condense the broad idea and the conceptualization into a more focused area. Uh, Shafka has already covered the economic uh, inducement area. Uh, uh, Abu sir, your question about um, uh, how to make us more homogeneous. Well, uh, cohesive. and cohesive. Well, uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm optimist, but I don't think there is any country in the world which will be totally homoge uh, homogeneous in terms of. Uh, uh, it could be homogeneous. I mean, we are already homogeneous in terms of ethnicity, 
but in, ta in terms of opinion, it, it is never possible. That is why uh, that is why the free will exist. But what we can do is, despite our and that that free will probably gets more influenced by the political uh, um, stimuli. So, what probably is probably uh, manageable is to uh, shrink that division. Your other question regarding uh, whether religious incitement could be, yes, that is the oldest form of uh, uh, conducting uh, 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 or disrupting social cohesion. And that surely is, is a toolkit for anyone who is trying to uh, wage a hybrid warfare against uh, our country. Uh, uh, our good friend Aisha Kabir, and definitely uh, that is a day-to-day -day challenge for the people in the media. Uh, and I don't see an immediate solution to that. But I do have a suggestion. I watch France 24, uh, which is another media channel. And w what they have is a very unique program that they will pick up the best trend, uh, highest trend news, and if and fact check that one. And that is done with a very precise uh, methodology where they would sort of take the picture and show you the metadata and then trace back and this is all in the TV. So uh, the fact check of that level probably uh, immunes that particular channel to uh, sort of um, be, uh, uh, to become so vulnerable uh, into sort of becoming a tool or pawn for others hybrid warfare campaign. Uh, Tanvir, uh, uh, I think I have no comments. You have already covered that much, much. Uh, for Tawhid, sir, I will just simply add, yes, uh, to, uh, 24, I will probably extend your uh, description of Bangladesh Liberation War being hybrid, not up to the end of September, probably even up to the first week of, or second week of November. Uh, till, till, yeah, in the 21st November when, when, when that uh, troops started crossing uh, the border. So that would be... Uh, actually, uh, as, um, actually, as per the UN General Assemblies and the Security Council's uh, speech by the Foreign Secretaries, it happened on uh, 21st of uh, 21st of November. That is why we have the Armed Forces Day, uh, and then uh, it was stopped, and they were asked to uh, remain put till 4th of uh, December. 3rd of December, so that a formal declaration is happens. So that uh, that was all uh, for Shamim, sir, uh, Excellency. Uh, sir, the, I think, uh, and this uh, this I don't want to be controversial here, but just to, because you 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 have highlighted a, a very particular concrete example, and there were many. But let me just put another very contemporary com and a, a very. <coughs> sort of a burning example and which, which also gives some room for uh, pondering. Consider the Nord Stream 2 incident in the Baltic. Nobody is blamed. Even the European Union could not pl blame the Russians. They have no evidence. What Nobody. Should, what should Russia do it? Yeah, the, so that's the and the Russia Russia could not also blame yes, America, true. despite the fact that Americans also there are uh, audio or uh, sort of open speech that this will be stopped. The act, but the fact is the act has happened, and this is only possible through asymmetric. Uh, there are through two theories. One is of course underground uh, underwater drones have gone and then plugged in something and exploded. The other one is of course from uh, divers. But the fact is, it has happened. Now, what is the effect? On the second day, on the ne very next day, Germany uh, announced a 200 billion euros package to alleviate the uh, sufferings due to the price hike of the uh, that that was caused because of the Nord Stream 2 uh, attack. And uh, th there was also um, uh, a huge uh, upheaval in the energy market. So, whoever, you can find out whoever is the beneficiary, but this is a perfect sort of good example of how this needs to be conducted. If anybody has, con and definitely somebody has conducted, uh, but we don't know. Even the most powerful countries do not know, and they could not 
uh, put any attribution to anyone. So the plausible deniability has remained. So this is a very perfect example, even in the middle of all the sensors being focused, satellites being focused there. So okay. with this, yeah, I mean, gazing is, is, is allowed, but in, in our own, own spaces, not. Uh, so th th that would be my sort of a, a very classic example of this, uh, this uh, thing. But one thing I want to uh, reemphasize that, uh, and what, sir, you have said, uh, I mean, traveling from first generation warfare to second generation, third generation, fifth generation. Actually, what, what it brings down uh, is that you know, the fact that if I talk from a point of view as a warrior for, uh, for military science, the ultimate battle space is actually in the mind. And with that, I will end my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, our panelists uh, were excellent in giving responses to your questions and comments. We have now come to the end of our today's deliberation on this very important topic. Before I go to my co-host Zafar Soban, editor of Dhaka Tribune, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank him. Because as you know, BIPS normally partners with the newspaper in conducting seminars and roundtables on st key strategic issues. Pre-COVID, we partnered with Delhi Star for a year. And post-COVID, when we started again, we partnered with Zafar Soban's newspaper, the Dhaka Tribune, for one year, and this is our last roundtable together with Dhaka Tribune. Next year, we'll also go to another newspaper to partner with them. So Zafar, you've been an excellent partner. Thank you very much. And for the last comments, I go back to you again. Uh, thank you so much. We have also enjoyed our partnership with BIPS, and I really feel that the I think it's been, has it been more than 12? Because I think we may have started in 2020. Um, monthly roundtables which we have convened together have been a really um, valuable addition to the discourse here uh, surrounding strategic affairs. And I think um, in many ways a lot of the subjects we have touched upon and discussed and given a platform to are subjects which are sorely under uh, discussed in Bangladesh. In fact, this final uh, round table we're doing today is a good example of that. If I'm not wrong, as Shafkat has mentioned, this is probably the first discussion ever. on hybrid war to have ever taken place here in Bangladesh. And I think it also shines a light on the fact that there are so many subjects where we really do need to discuss far more than we are doing. So. Um, We've really appreciated this opportunity to part with you, and you know, I know BIPS will continue to provide these kinds of platforms. Uh, Dhaka Tribune is also, in our own way, trying to do uh, something similar. Um, for me, this discussion has been a real eye-opener. I'm not sure how it is for many of the other uh, participants here, but uh, I knew very little about hybrid war as a concept before I sat down here, and I've learned a great deal in the last two hours, for which I thank um, our panelists, and I also thank the participants, many of whom who have raised very important and interesting uh, points, to which has helped uh, shine a light on this subject. My uh, concluding uh, sort of uh, thoughts on this is that it seems to me that um, at some level hybrid wars have perhaps always been with us because all wars have an, a direct and, you know, to some extent indirect uh, identity. And using the, the mind, as uh, has been said, is the locus of, um, of, uh, of, of war is something which has been uh, perhaps practiced since uh, ancient times when it comes to warfare. And, you know, and perhaps hybrid war, if we look at war as politics uh, uh, by other means, continued by other means, is almost a permanent condition. As we look around the world, we can see various uh, examples of this even today. And um, I think it was Ambassador Tawheed who mentioned that right now, according to his interpretation, Bangladesh is, in fact, um, the subject of a hybrid war. 
with Myanmar, and that's one which has been brought to our attention, and maybe the ultimate hybrid war would be ones we're not even aware of, because part of the uh, characteristics of a hybrid war are the clandestine nature of it, and the fact that it is being fought on many fronts, uh, some uh, which are um, apparent to the naked eye, and many which are not, which are only apparent to experts or those who are um, very knowledgeable about the area. I think what has come through very clearly uh, for me in today's discussion is that today, in the 21st century, in 2023, the dangers of hybrid war are far greater than they have been in the past. And this is, as other people have mentioned, because we live um, in these technologically advanced times where cyber warfare and um, other technological advancements make the waging of hybrid war, make the waging of multimodal war uh, far more devastating uh, than perhaps would have been uh, possible. Uh, a century ago or even several decades ago. And that's why we have to be absolutely um, alive to the vulnerabilities. And which then brings us to, or brings me, to the issue of what does this mean for Bangladesh. And I think, again, what we have learned is that uh, Bangladesh is extraordinarily vulnerable um, to the uh, to hybrid wars and uh, the impact it could have upon us. Um, not to say that other countries are not vulnerable, but here our focus being here in Bangladesh is always to be how do these subjects affect us individually as a society, as a nation. And the question then is, given this vulnerability, what kind of preparation have we taken as a nation? Are we focusing sufficiently to combat this vulnerability, to build up our um, strength to make sure that uh, given the the terrain of, of hybrid war that Bangladesh is, is amply protected and I think uh, regrettably what has come through from this discussion is we have a long way to go so again it's important to raise these issues but I think the real takeaway for me is that there's so much work to be done in Bangladesh needs to be extraordinarily alive uh, to this vulnerability. And I'd like to conclude by talking about uh, there, there are many areas of vulnerabilities, as, as uh, Shafkat has mentioned, as we um, move to a more digital, a more uh, cyber uh, uh, connected world, be it uh, the metro rail, be it other elements of governance, be it other elements of how we organize our society, the vulnerability is just going to grow. But even beyond the technological vulnerability, I think in a number of speakers, including the panelists, have mentioned this, the real vulnerability we have here in Bangladesh, which I think is, is um, in danger of exploitation, is our lack of unity as a society. And now, of course, this is not unique to Bangladesh. All countries in the world um, you know, unity is, uh, of course, impossible to achieve. And we see deep schisms in, in other countries as well. We deep see deep schisms in, uh, in the United States, in the United Kingdom. We live in a time of deep schism, it's certainly true. But I think when you unite all of our other vulnerabilities in Bangladesh with the massive divisions we have in our society, that puts us in, I wouldn't say uniquely, but I would say it puts us in an extraordinarily vulnerable position, and it's something which we need to be aware of. And given the, um, given the danger of hybrid war, I think one of the things we need to think about as a society is how can we heal these divisions? How can we come up with a, uh, identity or a mindset which at least, uh, you know, acknowledges that yes, there are divisions, acknowledges that yes, there are schisms, but where we focus on that which brings us together and allow us as a society, as a polity, as a nation to unite to the extent that we can combat, focus on and combat and overcome uh, these uh, threats which we face both internally and externally. And so I think that is 
my takeaway, and that's really what I feel that we should be focusing on. And once again, I'd like to thank BIPS and thank all of you, because I think it's through discussions and, and, and discourses such as these that we really start to build the kind of platform which is necessary to protect Bangladesh and to really move us forward. So thank you very much. So once again, thank you everybody for being with us today spending your valuable time this morning on an important topic. And please join me in thanking Zafar Soban, editor of Dhaka Tribune, and the panelists for their wonderful deliberations. This brings us to the close, and please join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you.